Welcome, guys. Week number 37, off and running. And uh, if you've been a part of the little side conversation we've had here over the last few minutes, I want to give you some numbers about our tallies on the Thanks Living message. This ties back to the challenge I issued last week that uh, let me know your, uh, your, the number of people you contacted for the simple purpose of just saying thank you. Uh, no other agenda, no other uh, thing that you're trying to finagle or do during that time, just a simple way of saying thanks. And as of right now, and this is, I know there's still numbers coming in. Guys are probably going to be sending to me by chat or text or email today, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. But as of right now, this group of men have contacted 372 men. Mm. 372 men got phone calls, got, uh, e you know, texts, got contacted, some face-to-face, -face, some over the phone. Uh, but 372 different people were contacted part of our Thanks Living Challenge. And I guarantee you that number is going to grow as uh, more guys get me their numbers over the next uh, 24 hours. Some of you are said you're going to actually, you're still working on it. And here's the exciting things about this, guys. That challenge wasn't just for that day only. I really, if you remember, I tried to say we should lead a life of thanks living every single day and be very, very, very quick to give thanks to God for, uh, for what he's doing and thank the people that God is using in our lives. So very powerful. And uh, I got some side comments from men just talking about how significant the day was for them personally, uh, how rewarding it was. Um, just some, some long time connections. Uh, uh, one guy went back to a high school coach that I actually personally know this high school coach hadn't talked to him in 25 years. He said, and he just said it was just a beautiful, beautiful conversation. So to God be the glory for that. So 372 is the number now, and that will grow. Um, next week, I'll try to remember to give you the new number, but that's where we're at as of right now. Uh, guys, um, you're in for a treat today. I got a chance to watch the video that uh, that where Clay's mom was featured uh, as part of the Robert Courtney uh, sting operation and what ultimately happened with him going to prison. Clay, I want to tell you, it was it was so good. I watched it twice. Uh, my wife watched it with me last night. Blown away. Very 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 impactful. And we're going to put in the chat line, guys. The information so that if you want to watch that video, it's about 45 minutes. It was produced by the Oxygen Channel, and uh, we'll give you that, that information. You can go back and look at the story and be reminded of the horrific uh, events that, that, are, that are part of today's talk that Clay's going to specifically talk about. So Clay, man, I, I, I'm, I'm eager to hear this because of what I watched uh, the last... Uh, these, these episodes that I watched. So it was very, very good. Um, thank you. Thank you, brother, for your willingness to share a very tender story with, with all our, our guys. And thank you, Lord, for, the, for, for what you're going to do with this, um, this talk, too. I know this is going to hit the nail on the head. So let's pray for Clay, and uh, let's get rolling. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the chance to hear from your servant, Clay, Clay Withers. Thank you, Lord, for how you've used this story to impact him. And now, Lord, I know that this story is also going to challenge us greatly. So, Lord, open our eyes, open our ears to your truth. May you be glorified today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Clay, take it away, brother. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, guys, so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, at the end of August, I wrapped up 38 years of pastoral ministry and my wife, Lori, and I began a brand new chapter in our life. Uh, the Lord showed us that uh, he was going to lead us down some new paths, and we didn't have a clue what that was going to look like. It's been extremely exciting for us. I'm kind of an adventure junkie, and uh, so this, uh, we have found our adventure. And uh, so we're really excited about these new days in our life. We launched a consulting firm called Mountaintop Consulting at the beginning of September. And uh, we've been providing life coaching and spiritual advising to a few area business leaders and their staff. Um, 
The Lord also has opened up some ongoing opportunities to speak and to preach for area churches. I love doing that. I uh, just finished a sabbatical gig for one of my pastor buddies and been providing pa- uh, pulpit supply in a couple other churches here recently. And uh, we're, we're kind of praying through whether we should uh, uh, take an interim pastorate um, for a local church here right now. So it's, uh, it's been extremely busy. Uh, God has shown his provision for us in the midst of a brand new level of faith for us. We've always been on a church staff for 38 years. And uh, this is absolutely pulled back the curtain on how good and faithful God has been in these moments. Uh, this morning, I'd like to invite you to think of one or maybe two things but certainly at least one big thing that may have wounded or hurt you deeply in your life. Something maybe that devastated you, something that cut you to the heart, something that may have changed actually the course of your life, something that was designed to destroy you or maybe even your own family. Has that come to mind yet? Now think about the face of the person that you blame for that. Not everybody that I know has faced something like this, but many of us have. I've experienced that same kind of devastating, unforgettable and unforgivable thing in my life. And I want to tell you about it this morning. My dad passed away unexpectedly in early 2000. And so most of the next year I spent helping my mom uh, more than usual. My mom was actually the prayer warrior that God used in my life when I was really living far away from him. The Lord honored my mom's selfless prayers to rescue me from a very destructive path in my life. I actually despised my mom's prayers for quite a few years because I was absolutely miserable. I was living under tremendous conviction from the Lord, which made me run faster and harder away from him. But my mom knelt day after day, month after month, and year after year, praying that I would come back to Jesus. My mom was my spiritual hero. Her prayer life was so very powerful, and it was effective in my life. And I'm so grateful to the Lord for her life, her faithfulness, her tenacity in prayer. In January of 2001, my mom was diagnosed with cancer and underwent successful surgery to remove a malignant uh, tumor from her body. She was scheduled to begin chemotherapy treatment starting in the spring after she healed completely from her surgery. All systems were go. And uh, she, as she began her chemo treatments, we were all very excited. She was excited. Her doctors were excited. Much faith, much hope, much belief that her life would be lengthened significantly and her quality of life would return. My mom was a professional woman. Uh, she worked as an administrative assistant for a federal judge in Kansas City. And she dressed to the nines every single day. She was so particular about her hair. She always looked like she was headed to a society party when she walked out the door in the morning. The thought of chemo treatments that would cause my mom's hair to fall out, oh, that was something incredibly difficult for my mom to think about. After months of treatments, she was actually feeling amazing and amazingly fortunate and thankful that she felt good, no fatigue, And in my mom's life, a miracle had occurred, no hair loss. She was so very grateful uh, that she was going to get to go through all of her treatments to kill that cancer and without any hair loss at all. After a few months of her treatments, I took a morning off to take my mom to her appointment. Usually I was not the one to do it, but I took that morning off. That particular morning, The doctor's office that she always went to had a note on the door informing all these patients that their treatments would actually be administered at Research Hospital connected by a ground level hallway. So she and I walked to the oncology floor and we checked in and her doctor's office was across the hall from the pharmacy. So the convenience 
was amazing for all of her treatments. About an hour or two after we checked in, uh, we got in her room and the chemo treatments began almost immediately. The phone in her room rang. So I picked up the phone, I was available and it was the FBI, the same Federal Bureau of Investigation FBI. I'd never talked to them before. I'd known one agent, but I'd never talked to him. And this agent identified himself and he reached and he asked if he could come uh, to my mom's room and to talk with us. Soon after the agent was there, it wasn't more than about an hour and a half. And the agent was there sharing some earth shattering news with us. In all likelihood, my mom's cancer fighting drugs had been diluted. I'd noticed that there was a sign posted on the glass doors of the pharmacy earlier that morning that said pharmacy closed. I didn't think anything about it. What we quickly learned is that the owner of this pharmacy, Dr. Robert Courtney, had been accused of diluting cancer fighting drugs for months at first, and then they discovered years. And then from the public court case, Actually, they discovered that he'd been tampering with drugs almost since the very beginning of his career. Within a couple of days, my mom's hair began to fall out, seemingly almost overnight, and the usual effects of the chemo treatments began to show up in her body. Things like fatigue and nausea, you know the drill. The next two months of treatments and its effects, as well as blood tests from her doctor, revealed that my mom's cancer was actually raging out of control with no treatable end in sight. My mom passed away on November the 14th, 2001. My family is a part of a very large group of local families deeply affected by this man's evil, this man's greed-filled decision that showed no remorse or care for the patients or their families. That is my wound. That is my injury. That is what happened to me and my family. Dr. Robert Courtney had a huge and public debt that I believe that must be paid. Our family was dealing with the almost overnight deterioration of my mom's health with no medical assistance to reverse its course. All because of the choices this pharmacist made, by the way, without regret. My mom and I were very close. As I said, she was my hero, my spiritual warrior who literally prayed me to Jesus years before. So I chose to leave work early many days and go in late other days and spend evenings in and out of the hospital sitting next to my mom. So we got to talk a lot about what had happened and what was next. The more than obvious emotion that I was dealing with was both anger, but it was quickly becoming a form of revenge. This was a very natural response, a normal pattern for great injustice, but that was not what my mom was talking about. She was talking about both heaven and God's amazing forgiveness for every act of sin that was ever committed by anyone and everyone, including herself. That was what my mom was talking about. The last few weeks before my mom's passing, my mom and I were praying together. And most of my prayers sounded like normal, usual prayers. I was asking God to somehow change the course of her health. Her prayers, however, were all focused on Dr. Courtney. His heart, his family, and how we would live well with this unforgivable heart. My mom's prayer life was different than mine, certainly. And it was different than most people I'd been around. You see, I'd preached I'd led worship for many, many years. I'd taught about forgiveness. I knew all the scriptures about it. 
I'd led worship for evangelistic crusades and conferences that focused on forgiveness. I sang songs about God's forgiveness. I knew them all. Suddenly, I was confronted with an injustice. I was confronted with cruelty that I didn't really have an answer for. My mom actually helped me start the process of actually releasing this man's sinful act that was taking her very life. I had one of the most difficult decisions ever facing me before or since. Will I do what I taught other people to do? Will I be who the Father created me to be? Now, we certainly have heard and maybe even used the phrase often, Scripture works every time. And every time, Scripture works. Greg, we've heard that a million times. We've used it ourselves. The truth is, we really don't know how Scripture works works until we're confronted with our own pain, our own injustice, our own loss, the major disappointment of our life. That's where our life of Bible quotes have to matter. They have to work. You see, I'd always taught that the Heavenly Father had paid for the most incredible access to Him through the shed blood and body of his own son. I'd taught that to other people. The question of my life was, will I ignore that access for the rest of my life? Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. This was the decision for me. This was the decision I wanted to make deep in my heart. I knew this is the only way I wanted to live the rest of my life. But what was at war was my mind, my will, and my emotions. I'd lost my mom. And this man helped take her life. And he has to pay an incredible debt for what he's done. I had all the buts in the world. The enormous amount of reasons not to forgive were there, present, screaming my name. But the enormous amount of forgiveness that Jesus paid for by his own life was bigger. I chose And I keep choosing forgiveness. Now, I want to ask you, my friends, would you allow the Holy Spirit, even now, to bring back to your mind, to your will, and to your emotions, your personal pain, your hurt, the injury of your life? Will you allow the Spirit of God to bring back to your mind right now the face or the faces who hurt you, the ones responsible, the ones who are to blame for your pain. What we know is life is simply full of hurt. It's full of disappointment. It's full of pain inflicted from other people. No one has to tell us that, do they? We have and we are experiencing that even right now. Now, men, I know this because I am one. We have a way of stuffing that stuff and ignoring that stuff the best way we know how. Now, women may do that too. I'm not really sure what they do. None of us in this room really know what women do. But I want to tell you something. You can stuff it all your life and you can try to ignore it, but it will not go away. It does not go away. It deepens and it grows and it becomes thick and impenetrable, and it keeps us from being able to walk in real peace, to walk in total joy, and to walk in the kind of freedom that Jesus paid for. 
this may be the most important question I'll ever ask you. Because it was exactly what the Spirit of God asked me. Is there any reason right now that you don't want that? Real peace, total joy, and the kind of freedom that Jesus paid for. Is there any reason why you wouldn't want that? Do you think that somehow you need to walk in unforgiveness one more day? I can tell you this, no one, no one can live well without total forgiveness. I see it all the time, all around me. I talk with people every single week whose lives are robbed of all that Jesus offered. Many Christians, many Christ followers are absolutely living without so much of what Jesus' body and blood paid for. One of my closest friends uses this a lot when he preaches. He says, we often live beneath our privileges that Jesus paid for. We've received forgiveness for our sin, past, present, and future. Oh, we know that. We can talk about that all day long. But as far as forgiving others, those who've wounded us, the ones who've devastated our dreams and our plans, somehow we've held on to that. All to the stolen joy and peace and freedom that is supposed to be a vital part, a vital part of the abundant life that Jesus has promised. Jesus said, I've come to give you life to the full, abundant life. That was Jesus' promise. That's supposed to be for here and now, not just something that you look forward to someday in heaven. He said he came to give you life now, abundant and full. I've come to know and understand, and now by God's power in my life, some powerful truths I practice about forgiveness. I want to share those with you right now. I think some of these are your fill in the blanks. First, I've come to know that real and total forgiveness involves three things, three elements. The first is seeing the injury, the wound, the pain itself. See it, put a name to it, feel it, and remember it. Number two is the actual debt. When you look at the debt that someone owes you, you have to look at God's justice for sin at the same time. You look at the intentional pain toward you and you look at what is right in the eyes of God. And the third area, the third element of total forgiveness is the actual cancellation of that debt. Many of us are fully aware of our pain, our injury, the wound that we carry. I'll never forget the first time I ever read John Eldridge's book, Wild at Heart. He talked about the dad wound, the wound of the father for the son. Many of us have had that kind of wound inflicted on us. We all are fully aware of the wound. And most of us have a pretty good eye of the debt, uh, idea about the debt uh, that needs to be paid for that injury. But the power of real, godly, total forgiveness involves that third area, cancellation of the debt. Most of us, including me, stop short of the full process. And as a result, we will carry in our spirit, our mind, our will, our emotions. We then carry an unforgiving spirit about other things that come our way. And this almost impenetrable cloud, which becomes the filter through which we're going to experience the rest of our life. A choice not to forgive, although can start with a single event or a person 
The choice not to forgive can and will become a very destructive pattern for our life. In fact, people around us know something is wrong. They may not know what it is, but they know something is wrong. Charles Stanley, who is one of the Bible teachers of my young, early Christian faith journey, who, by the way, has experienced enormous amount of pain and disappointment and wounding inflicted on his life by other people. He's been through it. And he has helped me make the choice to forgive for these last 19 years. He writes this. I love this quote. Let me read it to you. Unforgiveness by its very nature prevents human beings from following through on many of the specifics of living as a Christ follower and actually demands that they walk by the flesh rather than by the spirit. Did you catch that he said living as a Christ follower and he didn't say talking like a Christ follower? He said living like a Christ follower. Unforgiveness will cause us to walk by the flesh and not by the spirit. Our lives have become often filled with sound bites and Bible quotes and one-liners from our favorite preachers or Bible teachers. But we never know if this stuff really works until we are hurt, until somebody makes pain personal to us. You see what I've discovered, if God's work doesn't work in my life when I'm wounded and hurt personally by somebody else, then I'm not really allowing God's word to work in me at all. Those are tough, tough words, but they're true words. They're words filled with incredible promise and power. We only know that this stuff really works when we're confronted, when we are confronted, when I am confronted by injustice and pain. And the cool part is we get to choose real forgiveness. We get to choose total forgiveness. I made that choice. And I make that choice every single time I see his face, every time I hear his name, every time the event comes to mind, or when somebody else brings it up and reminds me of it, which happens all the time. Recently, maybe you heard on the news that there was a possibility that Dr. Robert Courtney could be released from prison early due to his own health and COVID concerns in prison. Now, the most disappointing, but also most anticipated response came from other Christ followers. Everything imaginable, hate, hate, anger was said about this man by Christ followers about that whole situation once again. I'm incredibly aware that forgiveness, here's your fill in the blank. Forgiveness is not simply a word we say. It is not a word we say, I forgive you. Listen, if there's not some ongoing fruit of that word, that word has no power. Forgiveness is not simply a word we say. Number two, forgiveness is not a simple or a one-time decision. I'm telling you, it is not simple at all. And yet it is so incredibly clear in scripture. It's not a simple or a one-time decision. Forgiveness, number three, is a past. It is a present and it is a future choice you and I get to make. It's a choice I must make to live well and to please the one who paid for my sin and your sin and Dr. Courtney's sin with his own blood. Lean in and listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you right now. Knowing this truth 
cannot and will not set you free. Now, some of you are like, this guy's become a heretic. I knew it. He was going to be a heretic all along. Listen again. Knowing this truth cannot and will not set you free. But practicing this truth can and will set you free. Because scripture works every time. And every time scripture works. But the cool thing about that is I get to choose to allow it to work in me, in this area. The gospel itself is all about forgiveness, actually. It really is. It's the reason that Jesus came to save his people from their sin, to seek and to save that which was lost. The only way to pay for that is that God forgives human beings. That's the story of Christmas. Christmas is all about forgiveness from God to us. And then our choice to receive that. And then our choice to offer forgiveness to other people. We cannot and we will not live well without it. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a transforming truth. It didn't just happen once, but the work was paid for once and for all. It's an ever-increasing, transforming truth in our life. And when practiced, the gospel cannot just be quoted. But when practiced, it changes the filter through which we experience life. Either we experience abundant and real life or less than promised. We get to decide. We get to choose. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15 says, For if you forgive men, just pause for a moment. For if you forgive men, right there you would insert the face and the name of your pain and the one who is to blame for it. For if you forgive men their sin, their transgressions against you, your heavenly Father will, will forgive you. But if you do not forgive, then your Father will not forgive you of your sin. It's not talking about your salvation here. It's talking about the rest of your life, your level of joy and peace and total power of God's presence in your life. That's what he's talking about here. You'll miss the ongoing avenue of grace and access into God's presence. That's pretty clear and convincing. It's really black and white, isn't it? No gray areas, no exceptions, and no excuses. Charles Stanley wrote this, to forgive means to release others from a debt incurred when they wronged us. The debt may be material or emotional, some form of hurt or utter embarrassment. Charles says, when we forgive, we assume the loss. We free others from the bondage of material or emotional indebtedness. And if we refuse to forgive, Charles says, we place ourselves in bondage to an unforgiving spirit, which is then accompanied by tension and strife and pressure and irritation and frustration and anxiety. That's a powerful, powerful picture Charles Stanley paints of what unforgiveness will do in the life of a Christ follower. I was teetering on the edge. I had every reason to unforget, to not be forgiving of Dr. Courtney. But I had more reasons to forgive. The truth is, I didn't want to live 
with tension and strife and pressure and anxiety and irritation all the days of my life. I didn't want that. I wanted joy. And I want joy today. I want peace. I wanted continual grace-filled access to the one who bought me with his body and blood. I wanted that. You don't get both. You don't get unforgiveness and continual peace and joy and access to the Father. Ultimately, I wanted to please my heavenly Father who gave up his own son for me. So here's my question for you, my friends. How about you? What about you? Is there any reason today that you want to live one more day with an unforgiving spirit? It's not ignoring or dismissing the injury or the hurt. It has nothing to do with that. In fact, you own it. You see it. You remember it. You name it. And you choose to cancel the debt. I want you to know something. It changed my life. It changed my past. It is changing my present. Because every time, every time I hear about it, Every time I hear another Christ follower spew words of anger and revenge and mean spirit about him, I choose to forgive. And it has changed my future from that day forward. Not only have I enjoyed access to my father, he has shown me, just like he promised Jeremiah, great and incredibly mighty things that I didn't know. He's unveiled his heart to me in ways that I would have missed had I held on to an unforgiving spirit. So how about you? Is there any reason you want to hold on one more day to unforgiveness? That person that you blame may be dead and gone. That doesn't matter. This is a business that you do with God. And God alone is the only one who can set you free. Would you let me pray for you? Father, I thank you. I'm overwhelmed, God, with the power of your promise to me that if I forgive a man, or multiple men, their sin against me. You will forgive me. But Lord, I am painfully aware also that if I have chosen not to forgive this man or many people of their sin, you will not, you cannot forgive my sin because it goes against your very nature. Lord, I pray this morning that there will be men in this place that will actually be set free from years of an unforgiving spirit. Lord, set free to know your incredible joy, total peace, and the powerful freedom that comes in forgiveness. Lord, would you set men free from the past and the present for the future. We pray all of this and give you thanks in Jesus name. Amen.